So um, I've I, today I, I'm really just wanting to share uh, my teaching practice um, with all of you and in particular my teaching practice around sustainability education. Um, but I'm going to start with telling you a bit of a story. Um, so the slide that you're looking at is going to be on for a little while um, and it's got some pictures of me when I was little and the farm that I grew up on and um, I'm just going to take it away with this story. So for as long as I can remember, I have loved textiles. One early memory I attribute to my love of textiles is regular visits to the Inglewood op shop. I grew up on a farm in the remote rural community of Riola. Not sure if anyone's heard of Riola. Um, it's just near Melville's Caves, if you've been there. Um, and our regular visits to Inglewood, our closest town, never disappointed. To me, the musty, dark and cluttered shop with strange smells represented glamour and opportunity. You never knew what amazing things you were going to find for 20 cents or a dollar. I distinctly remember that there was a rack of negligees and nighties at the back of the shop and my sister and I would always choose something highly inappropriate to purchase. Back then we went for 100% synthetic, lacy, transparent and preferably hot pink or some other lurid colour. Our mum would always say, gosh, who would have worn this in Inglewood? When we got them home, we would wear them for days and days and days, sometimes with gum boots. Mum would tie knots in the shoulder straps so the hem wouldn't drag along the ground. To me, the op shop was a wonderland of materials and possibilities and was the beginning of my appreciation for secondhand things and the narrative attached to material possessions. However, my early material experiences didn't come solely from other people's underwear. Possibly the most single influential experience that has shaped my curiosity and values regarding materials and sustainable thinking occurred through day-to-day -day rural life. As a child, I experienced raising animals, growing fruit and vegetables, planting trees, finding gold and living through floods and droughts. In my late teenage years, I would stay home from school when we were shearing sheep and work as a roustabout and learn how to pick up and throw a fleece. This experience was also where I began to understand the relationship between economics, the environment and raw materials as wool prices and weather conditions fluctuated. The seasons were experienced in full force on the farm. The long hot summers seemed interminable when the land was baked dry, brown and sparse and the cold wet winters chilled your feet to the bone walking to the bus stop painfully early over frosted surfaces. I spent so long on a school bus. <laughs> the seasons, however, were marked with so many pleasurable experiences, picking mulberries, figs, peaches and plums in summer, wild morels in spring, pistachios and grapes in autumn and persimmons in winter. My parents are still on the farm now and it's always remarkable to witness their perseverance and resourcefulness in creating and maintaining their rural existence. From the perspective of someone who has grown up on a farm, I have concluded that sustaining our quality of life depends on how we view and respect the natural world. And we must seek to understand how we can connect in a more intelligent way with our environment and the materials in our lives. The reason I'm telling you about where I grew up and some of my early and formative experiences is that I believe to teach sustainability authentically you must reflect on what sustainability means to you and how why you have formed your views and values what was your journey mine was rural life a love of textiles and fashion and then later on i traveled to turkey india japan france and switzerland to learn more about textiles and then i realized i was buying into a broken and exploitative system and then I had the incredible privilege of becoming an educator. Um, so as Libby did say, I'm a vocational teacher at RMIT 
And um, in 2009, I started delivering core sustainability units to first and second year textile design students in the training package that I teach into. And I guess this is when my quest first arose. Um, it was trying to seek more effective ways to communicate about sustainability with emerging textile designers. Because when I, when I first started teaching, um, I just became aware of how much I didn't know and how huge and complex um, sustainability in fashion and textiles was and how much work I needed to do to be able to effectively communicate um, such a complex subject. Um, so in 2012, I, I got a scholarship to do a graduate certificate in education for sustainability at Swinburne University. And that was a really transformative time for me as far as my teaching practice. And then I think that gave me the confidence to write about my teaching. Um, so I wrote some papers and started presenting papers. Um, and then I started my master's. And yep, I really do hope I finish next year. Um, and I, I undertook a really great course um, at the end of last year with some people in the UK, but I won't, I, I, I won't talk too much about that. Um, so textile design, um, that's the course I predominantly teach in, in case, uh, sometimes they farm me out to a few other courses, but it's mainly textile design. Um, so textile design and development is essentially a course that teaches students how to knit, print and weave. Um, the nature of this program places me in a unique position to engage students in sustainability themes because they are involved in multiple stages of a product's life from design, selection of raw materials, manufacturing and use. And there's just some beautiful examples there of some student work. Um, so my research and teaching practice is motivated, also motivated by fear and hope. Um, so some of my fears relate to recent global reports and statistics that highlight inconceivable and shocking truths about fashion and textiles and the health of our planet. However, I'm also motivated by hope, global goals, leading thinkers, and the hope I place on design graduates entering the industry with skills, knowledge and motivation to pursue sustainability. Um, so I think you'd probably all agree with me that COVID-19 has illustrated the need for change as the world grapples with this strange trauma. It has shown us that we must do things differently and has shifted many people's priorities worldwide. It's a unique transformative marker in time and for me, the experience, has, the experience has reinforced the significance of research related to sustainability and education. And just recently, I'm not sure if anyone um, in, in who's here today um, caught the Dateline episode on SBS, but they were investigating the impacts of the pandemic on the global fashion industry. And it was just devastating hearing firsthand stories from garment workers who are already trapped in a cycle of poverty and have absolutely no financial safety net. Um, and, and they were left worried about starvation, eviction, and the future of their children. So the way I see it is that there are many pieces to the puzzle and it's my job to work out what the pieces are and how they connect. Um, so this includes thinking about how to take the information I read, hear, learn, know, and turn that into meaningful learning. And I guess that really is um, the job of most teachers. It's just extra hard when these pieces of the puzzle um, are so dense and multifaceted. Um, so students often want absolutes and, and they want to sort of get sustainability straight away. So, so they'll often ask me, is this fibre sustainable or not? You know, should I wear this? Should I not wear this? Is a particular company good or bad? They want yes or no answers when the reality is that the answers are murky 
and depend on so many variables and what lens you are looking through. So sustainable fashion and textiles are the ultimate paradox, and that's possibly what I'm trying to help learners to understand, that the thinking required to make assessments and form opinions when the information is so complex is hard. You need to be a researcher, a detective, a communicator, a systems thinker, and try to normalise the feeling that new information about sustainability is not threatening or depressing but empowering and liberating. And it's a lifelong journey. The learning doesn't stop. I am proof of that. It's the one subject that I, I, I'm always updating my teaching materials because there's um, it's a fast changing space. Oops, sorry, I wasn't quite ready for that one yet. Um, I'm also really open with my students that I have an agenda. And that agenda is basically that I want them to reassess their current values in relation to consuming, designing, making and waste and foresee a range of sustainable opportunities and ask what kind of future they want. I want to link all learners personally and meaningfully to sustainability so they can integrate new knowledge into their life and work. So to do this, however, you have to go to the heart of the problems, and there are many. So possibly everyone in this room is aware there are many challenges facing fashion and textile industries. So the industry's most damaging aspects relate to high usage of chemicals, water and land, CO2 emissions, slavery, um, child labour, imposed wage poverty, in supply chains, unethical treatment of animals and unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. And Australians are reportedly the second largest consumers of clothing and textiles per capita after North Americans. And then a lot of that is going to landfill, which is another problem. So another piece of the puzzle is finding your sustainability heroes or key people. Um, so I'm not sure if there are other teachers um, in this forum who are teaching sustainability and maybe this is something you've already done. Um, but I always find it really fascinating to hear, you know, who people are looking at and reading and listening to. So it's, it's really important to find the people that resonate with you and make sense. Um, of the mass of information. So read and listen to what they have to say. Knowledge building has been one of the most important parts of developing a strong teaching practice in sustainability. So I've just got 12 people here who I think are really amazing. Um, I don't think Libby mentioned this, but I've put together a list of resources for everyone to be emailed after this presentation and in that um, list, I've, I've mentioned who all of these people are and what they do and um, links to their various organisations or books or whatever. Um, but finding these people and finding out what they do is really important because, yeah, they're the people on the ground doing really incredible work. Um, but I just wanted to mention number eight, Bruce Pascoe, because uh, um, he might be the odd fit in this slide, but I thought just for gender balance, I maybe should put a man in this slide. Um, but the way I see it is that there is no fashion on a dead planet and the indigenous and regenerative farming practices described in Dark Emu. Um, I'm not sure if people have read Dark Emu. It's a pretty amazing read. Um, gives hope that perhaps one day our colonial views of land care will cease to be dominant practice. As Bruce Pascoe says, accepting the full history of the country has the benefit of discovering a whole new level of sustainability. And I really hope that happens one day. Um, but yeah, in, in the email that Libby sends after this, you can find out who all the other people are, or maybe you already know. Um, so I do a lot of reading. Um, one day I dream about reading things that aren't about sustainability, like reading a uh, novel. 
Um, but at the moment, pretty much everything I read is related to sustainability. So I need to talk about Kate Fletcher. So that's the two books in the top right hand corner. So she is a fashion and sustainability pioneer, design activist, writer, nature enthusiast, research professor. Um, and she's probably the single most influential figure in my pursuit to find out more about sustainability. I refer to and draw inspiration from her books regularly. It was also through Kate Fletcher that I first on an intellectual level thought about the emotional connections we have or can have with clothes and what that means in the context of sustainability. Her book Craft of Use, the red excuse me, the red one, um, was interesting to me because it explored sustainability through storytelling and imagery. For me, it was also a kind of manifesto to autonomous fashion, a way of thoughtfully and personally interacting with fashion beyond trends, capitalism, consumption and marketing. It was about making your own rules and narrative and you decide what has value and why. And Craft of Use pre presents a fascinating potential for engaging in narrative about what we already have. And I just feel like I'm showing off here, but I get to tell my story on page 90 in case anyone has this book. Um, and I'm talking about going to the op shop in Inglewood. Um, so even little old Inglewood op shop is in Kate Fletcher's Craft of Use. So that was exciting to find out. Um, the Sustainable Fashion Handbook by Sandy Black, also from the UK, she's credited with being one of the world's pioneering authorities on sustainable fashion um, and has assembled an incredibly diverse range of perspectives. Ecotextile News, a bi-monthly publication. Um, I really like to nerd out in the library with the latest publication. There's a website, um, but it 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 often talks about um, technology certifications. It's quite European based, um, but some of those really dense reports that come out on sustainability, eco textiles will simplify them, simplify the information for you. Um, and it's unbiased information. Um, so it's really great source of what's happening in the industry. Um, and then Fewer Better Things by Glenn Adamson. My God, that is such, it's so incredibly inspirational. Um, he's a brilliant storyteller. What I found utterly compelling was the overwhelming case he put forward about engaging with objects, the objects around us. He talks about this notion of material intelligence and how broadly speaking, we are so disconnected from the materials in our lives. I cannot recommend this book enough. It's wise, accessible, and should indeed become a manifesto for modern living and has been really helpful for my teaching. Um, okay, so just getting back to my teaching practice. So learning about EFS, which I did in Swinburne, um, which is Education for Sustainability, changed my teaching practice significantly. It is an internationally recognised pedagogical platform um, for teaching in sustainability. And the Australian government back in 2009 wrote a national action plan about sustainability and education. And that was a direct result of the UN's decade for education. And I guess for me, it was the first time I made the link between global goals, so global UN goals, and my teaching practice. So I suddenly felt really responsible as an educator and kind of empowered by the importance of my mission to embed EFS in all my teaching. And as a result, the emphasis on my teaching became much more about transformation and change. And I began to actively look for ways to facilitate an evidence change. Um, so as a result of that, also I've been reading a bit about transformative learning theories um, and I found some of Jack Mezzarau's theories really useful in relation to my teaching practice and in particular his writing about values. So according to him, there is no such thing as a value-free educational experience. 
to avoid the question of values is to opt for perpetuating the unexamined values of the status quo. And since most educators are committed to helping learners change, which I think we are, and believe that such change should lead to making the world a better place. Um, so it's been really interesting to kind of look at um, transformative learning in that theoretical framework. Um, so I guess if I had to kind of, you know, condense my teaching focus down into maybe three points. Um, I really focus on knowledge. So knowledge sets associated with being a designer and I guess specifically material knowledge um, and also the skills of the textile designer. Activism, knowledge sets to develop citizen activism. And then a really important one is about meaning. So be becoming and being meaningful in the world. So really helping students make links between global issues and themselves. So personalizing and localizing complex issues. So it seems more, ex more tangible. Okay, so, but where do I actually start? Um, in my very first class, when I've got new students in their first year, um, this is where I've been starting for quite, for a long time. We get into groups and we define what sustainability is. So I do ask them to put their phones away, no phones, no Google, just good old fashioned discussion, and then come up with a paragraph or two and present that to the class. And it sounds really simple, but generally students find it hard and then very quickly realize that maybe it's not as easy to define as they first thought. Sustainability has many dimensions and means different things to different people. And then we look at 10 commonly used definitions and discuss and to see and see which ones resonate with them. Um, so defining um, words that you just think, oh yeah, everyone knows what that means is a really good activity to do in class. Because the other thing is, I think often people have an idea in their head of what sustainability is, but then when they try and articulate that, it's really hard. So when you actually sit down with students and define different words, it helps with their sustainability um, literacy. And the more sustainability literacy students have, the more confident they feel about um, talking about sustainability. Um, and then you can just see on the right there, there's some other activities that I do. Right, so early on in the first eight weeks of teaching students, um, I, we do lots of little activities that are ma mainly about discussion, reflection and writing. Um, and I call them the scaffolding skills. So we do futures thinking and you ask them all to think about, you know, what your life's going to be like in 30 years from now. They're so shocked that they're going to be old. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to be that old in 30 years. But, but you ask them, like, how will you buy fashion? What will education look like? What, what sort of jobs will you be doing? Um, and then think about probable and preferable futures. Um, yeah, it's really important and most people do not, it's really hard to think about that too, like where will I be in 30 years? Um, hopefully I'm not teaching, I think I'll be way too old, but um, it's good, it's a good exercise for people to do. Um, do a lot of reflection on on personal habits and write action plans and, and set goals, personal goals around your creative practice or um, your workplace. We write letters to people. Um, and again, that sounds really simple, but mostly the students that I have, when we do the letter writing activity, it's the first time that they've thought, oh yeah, I'm allowed to approach this company that I give money to and ask them about their supply chain and about their labor practices. And I know I've had some students who have found it really empowering. They've just never thought about doing that. Um, but, you know, it's really important to be a activist in this sense and, and it puts pressure on people to do the right thing. Um, so that's a really good activity. 
and also, you know, I'm lucky we're, we're in Melbourne. Um, there's still quite a bit of industry around us in Brunswick and Coburg. And so we visit factories and invite guest speakers in and I harass people all the time over the over email saying, can we come and visit you or do you want to come and visit us? Um, and, and that's really great too. So that's, that's really broadly, I guess, how um, I start. Um, and then it gets a bit darker when we start watching some of the documentaries. So, so most of you may have seen some or all of these. Um, watch the story of stuff. It was made a while ago, but it's amazing how this puts things into perspective for students. And usually I ask students who's seen the story of stuff, M maybe one or two hands go up, um, but it's a 20 minute video. Um, and Annie Leonard's incredible. So it kind of goes through extraction, manufacturing, planned obsolescence, theories around consumption, advertising, chemical use and waste. And then after that, you ask students to reflect on their consumption habits, ask questions around their consumer behavior. Um, so all the things that we watch, I then you know reflect, you then turn the mirror on yourself and, and think about, um, you know, your own behavior. Um, so true cost is a must watch. And again, I'm, I'm not sure if any or all of you have seen this. Um, it may upset some people. It's got some really confronting themes and images. And I think I watch it every year with students and I still cry. Um, but it's important. It unveils the magnitude of suffering, injustice and environmental damage caused by fashion. But again, follow up with a discussion about some of the themes. Look at, do, look at who is doing amazing work advocating in this space. And again, ask students pertinent and reflective questions. So true cost, watching true cost leads you into the ethics territory. And it's always one of the trickier topics to tackle as people can feel personally attacked, shamed or guilted for buying fast fashion or cheap fashion. However, it's important to remember that we've probably all participated in unsustainable and unethical fashion. We all have garments in our wardrobe that were made probably in appalling and unethical working conditions. But the point is that once you know and have time to reassess your values and pay attention, that this can change. You can opt out of that system. And it can be really empowering knowing that you're not giving money to billionaire assholes. Also, sometimes student ask, students ask me, but True Cost was made in 2015. Haven't things changed? And I say, yeah, they have changed. They've got worse. And they've got worse because we all know, but it's still happening. So I like to give them 21 reasons why we still need to talk about fast fashion. Now, this was me doing a really quick Google search from 1998 to 2021. Um, I think I skipped a few years, but some years I could have chosen any of 10, you know, labour about labor abuse scandals to put in here. Um, so, you know, it's, not, it's, it's sort of a, they're sobering slides, but you know, 2013 Bangladesh factory when Rana Plaza collapsed, it was meant to be a turning point and a lot has changed. There has been a lot of positive action, um, but still to today, to 2021, um, it's still happening. And then I'm not sure if any of you caught Four Corners a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, uh, it was focused on fast fashion, so it would be fantastic to show your students. Um, but I guess it highlighted that people are constantly on their devices now. And I think when they this documentary was talking about people, they were mainly talking about millennials, but saying that um, people are constantly shopping, constantly on their devices, constantly shopping, um, and clothes from certain brands are so cheap. It doesn't even matter if they don't fit, you don't wear them, you only wear it once um, or you throw it away. And they did focus on a particular CEO of Pretty Little Things. Um, and in stark contrast to Kumani's celebrity draped lie, 
it was revealed in the Four Corners doco that workers in the Leicester factory in UK are making clothes for pretty little things for less than half the minimum wage. Um, they're working 14 hour days, no heating, no cooling, no masks, no sanitizer, no COVID-19 prevention measures. So these are the things like I get really mad about this and um, I get to, to get really mad about it too. And it's great because you can take, you can take that rage um, and that injustice that you feel and, and that's what it takes to transform or change sometimes. But I'm going to leave fast fashion there. Oh, no, actually, there could be another slide. Um, this is a great slide. Um, you cannot exploit women in one country to empower them in another. Um, and then very quickly, I, I usually finish sessions off by posing lots of questions. Um, so sometimes we we answer them or sometimes we really just think about it, them or discuss them. Um, but again, always asking questions um, just helps with students being active learners because they know questions are coming and not sort of passively taking in the information. Okay, now I'm leaving fast fashion there. So more about my teaching practice in relation to materials. So materials are at the heart of many of the projects I undertake with students. And it has been identified that having a good understanding of raw materials can impact significantly on the sustainability credentials of a textile. So I have been undertaking different projects for a long time, but these are some of the most recent ones and collaborations. Um, so in the middle, there was the tiny house project that we did in 2019. And this was a, collab a collaboration between textile design and furniture design students and was a unique opportunity and challenged students to carefully consider the potential impacts of their design decisions and production methods and encouraged people to value and find meaningful connections with the objects in their life and to be more curious about the things in their interior environment. So we did sort of build up exercises about talking about your most favourite thing in your house, how it was made, how long you've had it for, and the least favourite thing in your house. Um, so just thinking about those connections with what's around you. Um, in this instance, material knowledge was built through reusing local industrial textile waste. So we went to three different factories that were really close by to uni and they all had so much waste that they could donate and waste is just a wonderland for textile um, design students because it's free um, and then you get to be really creative about um, what what you do with it. And then we we're also looking at low impact solutions for print production. Um, so we engaged with um, a digital printer to a local digital printer for some of the print production, which was exciting for the students. So the work was exhibited on the city campus and the project was documented in a short film, but, but that was a great project. Last year, we partnered with ECA to celebrate um, their 20 year anniversary, and that was a little Instagram exhibition, if you can have an exhibition on Instagram. Um, okay, so, oh, did I miss a slide? I think I might have missed this one. Um, so I've tried to, when I can, go to um, farms. Um, because going to the start of the supply chain is an excellent way to increase a student's material knowledge, hearing firsthand from farmers about the complexities, hardships, rewards, and the environmental and economic factors associated with farming can be transformative. It is at the farm that students come to realise that products don't just place themselves on shelves. This kind of experiential learning requires critical thinking about the context and processes of textile design and how it is linked to sustainability. And I really think students start looking at their woolen fabric, woolen yarn differently when they've just met a sheep or they've met an alpaca and, and really heard about what goes into raising those animals for fibre. And again, this new knowledge has the potential to create different future actions. And just on that, one thing that I didn't put in the resource list is to watch Landline. It's really great. Um, there's often 
stuff about wool or cotton and they have some sustainability um, specials and they've got really great knowledge. Um, so material knowledge can be gained through visiting industries. So this is at the ABMT factory in Melton, which is a fully certified processor of organic cotton, knits, um, and all fibre dyes and auxiliaries are GOT certified. So GOT is global, GOTS is global organic textile standard. Um, so the material knowledge that is gained here relates to chemicals, processing and manufacturing. So material knowledge itself is, you know, quite a vast area. Okay, so thank you so much for being really patient. We're getting towards the end. Um, so ask lots of questions and gather feedback. Um, RMIT has a way of gathering feedback, the student surveys that has a lot of graphs and percentages, but it never really gets to the heart of maybe, you know, what was the most um, impactful part of the learning. So I use a technique that I learned called most significant change and it asks two questions and really gives you an insight into what has had an impact. Um, so, yeah, it's really about what had the most impact on you and has any change occurred in your life and then you can define change um, in, in different domains, I guess. Um, so I got my lovely second year students just to do this recently and they do, they write such thoughtful and nice things. So th this is a set of swatches from our sustainability, uh, from a sustainability project that we did. So part online, um, part in real life. Um, beautiful swatches by Kerry Ryan. Um, but as she said, learning about sustainability has had a profound impact on me. I was surprised at what I didn't know and I learned a lot about the state of the textile industry. It changed the way I viewed textiles. I decided that secondhand and repurposing had to be my path. I stopped buying new clothes <laughs> and textiles. Um, I've learned a lot and I want to keep learning. You know, for a teacher, that's the best thing you can hear. I want to keep learning. I promoted myself as sustainable before studying textile design, but my knowledge base was lacking. Um, but as all my students know, you just can never learn enough. It goes on and on. So the lovely Anna Petitis from a few years ago um, and her, her gorgeous woven samples. Now upon some reflection, I can articulate the sustainability learning I have taken as having a profound and significant effect on my personal life. It illuminated numerous issues I had not considered and it raised my awareness and making different choices. So. It's a great way if you want to see, you know, has there been any kind of transformation? Has, have, have people changed? It's just how you word the questions. Um, and it makes you feel good as a teacher to read this. Uh, Tessa is a current student at the moment. So I'm now very conscious and aware of my design process and consider all aspects from initial design through to production and manufacturing and the end of life options available. I'm careful with what resources I use and if they are harmful to the environment through my creative process. It's a really nice thinking about there and that kind of idea of life cycle analysis thinking um, where, where you're kind of going from the start to the end, you know, what are the end of life options and then right back to the selection of materials at the start. Liz, who's a current student who's been doing these really fantastic experimental seaweed weavings. Um, you know, so great to read that learning about sustainability has changed everything. I know, now buy secondhand clothes, I only buy natural fibres. My weaving practice is based on a life cycle assessment and I'm becoming more vocal in my local community. And Liz, oh my God, she's been writing letters to her local council about what are they going to do about the textile waste in their area? Um, so she's become a real um, advocate. She's fantastic, got a lot of energy. Um, and we're nearly there, folks, so thanks for bearing with me. But I just, I've read, you know, a couple of times people saying, doesn't really matter what small ind individual actions people take. There's 
100 companies that are doing all the damage and, you know, that they've got to change or nothing's going to change. Um, but I don't believe that. And I think there's a lot of evidence that small individual changes are really important because collective shifts in mindset can have a huge impact. And I've been reading Sarah Wilson's book, This One Wild and Precious Life, given to me by Libby. <laughs> um, it's a pretty intense book. I'm not sure if it's the right book for lockdown, but no, Lib, I have really enjoyed it. But uh, it just caught my eye when she said Project Drawdown, a US nonprofit organization has shown that many consumer-led changes make the biggest dent in emissions. And Lucy Siegel, who's a journalist who was right there at the start, um, for anyone labouring under the misapprehension that their individual decisions are too small or too insignificant to have any influence over the status quo, I want to set you straight. Um, and I just have to put this in. I've always got to have something about fast fashion. Takes a major fashion CEO just four days to earn what a female garment worker in Bangladesh will earn in their entire lifetime. This is what makes my heart rage. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier I did an online course last year just just in November towards the end of lockdown with some amazing people called The Right Project run by three women and they asked for feedback and they very nicely you know put they put a couple of my feedback um, responses on their Instagram feed and this came from something that I wrote maybe for my master's but um, for all the teachers out there, and I'm not sure um, how many of you are teachers, um, but working with sustainability in education can be so difficult and it's one of the hardest things that I have to teach. And it's not like printing because I also teach print. You know, everyone's just so happy all the time in the print room because you showed them how to do something and then they learned how to do it and then they had this thing at the end that they loved. Um, but sustainability is not like that. It's more of a slow burn. Um, and facing the realities of change does require effort, courage and commitment. And also remember that courage literally translates to rage of the heart. Um, and then just to end on a quote from Francis Corner, who's a UK academic, educators are in a privileged position and that is how I see my role. Um, and I am going to use my role um, to do everything that I can to, um, yeah, kind of create some transformation towards a sustainable future. And as, sh as she says there, education must be a potent catalyst for change, which I couldn't agree more with. So on that note, thank you so much for listening and I, I really didn't think that I would be doing this in another lockdown and um, you all gave up some precious daylight sunshine hours to sit here in front of a screen when everyone's so sick of listening to people talk through a screen. Um, I've also put in the resources list my email, my Instagram, the work Instagram that I co-run with some other teachers and I would be more than happy to answer questions um, or if anyone would ever wants to get in touch with me for any reason, probably sustainability education um, related, that's fine. Because I think it's really important to um, create networks and share information. Um, and I think that's it from me, but I, I really want to thank you so much 